Okay, and we are live. Um, so, I think they've upgraded the interface here. So, nice to see everyone. Thanks, everybody, for joining. I um, want to go ahead and go through the agenda uh, today and get ourselves uh, planned up. Um, I have a few updates, but really I just kind of want to go around and get everybody else's updates and then um, see if we can get ourselves organized here for the next few months. Um, so, a couple updates. Um, and maybe I'll think of some more as we go. But um, finally, oh, actually, we, we're still waiting for Alex, aren't we? That's right. But uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. He is invited. Uh, we expect him to, to show up a bit later. Let's see, Alexander, I'll add him to the, uh, yeah. OK. So, um, so after many months of, um, of uh, walking through the desert of not having any uh, data for the muscle cell beyond um, about 40 to 60 uh, time points of a muscle cell, um, we have finally received a contribution of data from muscle cell. Um, very, happy to, very happy to report this. Um, I do want to name our benefactor here. Um, so I this this came through Christian Grove, who connected me to a gentleman named Michael Francis. Um, Mike Francis is a researcher at UMass, um, and um, we started this conversation about. A month ago, I think, uh, we started going back and forth in email, explaining what it is that we wanted. Um, and his graduate student, Dennis Turretin, uh, has attached two files with actual potential data from a prep recording from the muscle cell, a prep where you um, slice open the side of the worm and uh, the muscle cell comes out and you, you can um, record with an electrode. Those files were uh, given to us in the last couple weeks in a format known as uh, Igor Pro, I-G-O-R Pro. Uh, Igor is a popular software package used for doing electrophysiological recordings. Um, uh, and the particular files are sort of a binary format. Um, I've been inquiring a bit about um, code that uh, is in the open source to read this. Uh, there is some um, in, in a few different languages. MATLAB is one. Um, but uh, the best way to do it is to get a hold of a copy of the program itself, um, which uh, Mike Bella um, actually knows someone who or works near a lab that, uh, that has that. So I wanted to let Mike uh, tell us a little bit about um, about opening it up and just having a quick look at it. Obviously, I don't think you've had a lot of time since you were out last week, but um, you want to say a little bit about this uh, muscle cell data, what you saw? Um, yeah, sure. <clears throat> so it looks just like action potentials um, spiking at around 10 hertz. Uh, what I did was I just opened up, opened up um, these files in, in the Igor Pro software they're kind of an archive, so they were kind of a, a mess, and I, I basically got them and converted them into just plain text, which I emailed, which I emailed to you, Stephen. Um, what I would say is we need some clarification about the experiments. I don't know if that's documented or if we could just email them. Uh, specifically, are there any kind of synaptic blockers or channel blockers during this experiment? It's not obvious um, what kind of current injection is being applied doing the experiment, and whether they've done things like account for junction potentials. So we do need some, st we do still need some clarification over about the exact experimental conditions. But there's about, there's about, I guess, about 15 recordings, and they all seem to be quite high quality recordings. So yeah, it's fantastic. It's, it's a great way for us to move forward. We just need some more clarification over the exact experimental conditions. But all in all, it's great, great job. And so yeah, so we don't have the software in my lab, but Someone in the lab next door to ours does, so I can pop in any time and just do this. It's not a problem. That's fantastic. So in anticipation of that, I did ask the postdoc who um, who got us the data about that, and he he said in an email um, there should be a notebook file in the Igor experiment file explaining the experimental details and uh, protocol. And he says so the problem. Yeah. The problem is that 
for whatever reason, I got an error saying the notebook could not be opened because I thought of that, but uh, it didn't work. Okay. So maybe maybe I'm using an old version of Igor Pro, or I mean, God, God knows. It's it's. Uh, I can okay. try again. I can try and sort that problem out. Okay. Uh, I'll yep. Sorry, I think we have some copies of Igor Pro. It might be an older version in the Silver Lab as well. Um, I can try maybe opening that here as well. Is it actually on the um, Dropbox or anything? Ah, uh, yes. So not yet, um, okay. but it, it should be. Um, yeah, I was just so excited. We were just we we're just emailing it around. So obviously, yes, we will we will put it on the Dropbox um, and have and give you a chance to look at it. I'll also. For those of you who do have Igor nearby, I will loop you in on, on my reply to uh, to Dennis, uh, just uh, so that we're on the same page about what the what the issues are with that. But um, yes, good. Okay, so um, let's um, let's stay with Mike then. Um, if uh, if there's anything else in terms of um, what you see what you see doing with this data next, or you know, um, here on this bit. Sure. So um, you remember. Two weeks ago, I said that I'd put my initial model for the muscle cell um, on GitHub, but it wasn't really feasible for anyone to use it because I had some dependencies on libraries which no one has. That's no longer the case, so um, anyone who has Neuron should be able to pull, pull my model off GitHub and run it. Um, once we get some clarification about the experimental conditions, I can start doing some proper optimization of that model and trying to get it to work. Um, Try, I mean, trying to get it to replicate that experimental data faithfully. Um, so yeah, so there's that. You can you can all check out that model if you have if you have neuron. Just um, one one more thing is I've got a meeting with a guy called Mario De Bono, set for the first of June. Uh, he's quite a I think he's quite a big name in in um, C elegance electrophysiology. And he he might be willing to share data and perhaps more importantly some of his expertise um, with us. So hopefully hopefully um, yeah I'll I'll send you guys his send you guys this this guy's um, lab lab page. So there you go. So if if we can get this guy interested in the project that would be fantastic because he is he is a, an expert and. Um, yeah, might have access to some great data, and it's just down the road from me. So I've got a meeting with him on the first of June, and I'll let you I'll let you all know how that how that goes. And if there's anything if there's anything uh, anything I should know anything b before that meeting, then perhaps you and I, Stephen, could could uh, talk about that because it would be a fantastic dev on board. So yeah, so those th those three things. I've had a look at the data; it seems very good. Uh, my model is now online for all, everyone to check out, and I've got a meeting with this guy, which ho hopefully will be pretty productive. Terrific. Awesome. Great. Awesome updates. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Um, so let's keep going for additional updates. Um, um, so I have, as a next bullet, simulation engine updates. I saw some, um, I saw many commits and check-ins from that, um, looking at uh, Matteo here. Um, and maybe some Giovanni as well. Do you guys want to update on uh, what's new there? Uh, well, I've been uh, I've been trying to start putting in place a skeleton for the um, for the front end. So what we had so far was basically, if you remember, the graph that movie that uh, was showing basically the simulation going on in the neural simulator uh, solver. That uh, was using GPU and all well, since day one. Basically, that was just a sort of a, a prototype to prove the concept and the communication between all the bundles and all the technologies that we were using. So, the what I started there and I created a new bundle for the simulation engine uh, wants to be the kind of proper front end for the simulation engine. So that is not. Uh, coupled with uh, any simulation in particular, and that will be just interfaced uh, with, um, basically it will be just receiving a stream with the data that needs to be represented. And uh, like I, I've been working on it with uh, Giovanni, we were basically mm, experimenting different kind of engines, uh, leveraging uh, WebGL as a technology to show and like what I, was showing you the other day, Stephen was basically the 
current status. It, it, it's a, it's a slightly more than a tutorial, uh, than a tutorial stage still. So it's like we we don't have a, a working engine, of course, but it's like we do have a basic uh, Web 3D engine that is using uh, basically that is built on top of an NSGI bundle and that is suitable to be integrated with the rest of the of the simulation engine. So the idea moving forward is like I, I am bringing it up in the background. Uh, as soon as we'll finish it, I will share the screen. But it, it, it's nothing uh, too impressive. But the the goal will be to uh, basically uh, put together the design and after the implementation, you know, to allow the simulation engine to stream whatever thing is that we are simulating. So it could be the SPH simulation that uh, for which uh, um, Sergey already contributed the, the solver and so that we should be once that's done for instance in a position to see the particles moving and bouncing around in the same way that we were able to see in the demo that Andre has. Uh, and I, I just it's important to close the loop in the simulation engine so that we can start experimenting there in the same way that we've been doing so far on our counterpart with C code, for instance, so that once we have that, we're in a better position to basically show off results to the simulation engine and not have to depend on third-part products and tools, which obviously fragment the kind of development. Got it. Do you want to go ahead and, and show us, or just take a minute? Yeah, it, it, it's it, it's starting, so you can uh, maybe you can go ahead because it might take just another minute in order not to waste it. And as soon as it's uh, up and running, you will see it instead of my face. <laughs> and if I can add something, I think he yes, said uh, pretty much everything. Um, I'm myself. I'm focusing on investigating options for a streaming component. So I'm looking at web sockets and all that stuff. Try to get uh, some examples to work and understand how that stuff works because I've never touched it before. But it seems pretty okay. Just need to find something that works in our environment, get it to work first, see how it works, and then see if it's compatible with our environment. I found some decent examples that are promising. So I'm in the process of getting those to, to run on their own and then I'll probably try to put it in the simulation engine and see as a first step if we can basically um, refactor the prototype with the, with the graph for the voltage for the simulating notch can actually if we can refactor that to use streaming rather than just polling the server every HTTP polling so that's pretty much it. Uh, Matteo is showing this uh, it's basically web WebGL engine working, but it's showing random stuff. It's just, just a test. Okay. Awesome. You gotta start somewhere. <laughs> it moves. It, it it moves, and as you can see, it's pointing to the simulation engine uh, front end bundle, which is kind of nice. Good. <laughs> All right. Well, that's pretty much it. Awesome. So, how how can people? Uh, and so, you've updated the documentation so people can uh, play with it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I tried to make an effort uh, uh, last night in order to have a the documentation uh, a bit more. Uh, Comprehensive of all the steps that are required in order to download the download the sources and play with this. So it's like it's in the Google Doc that we already had, and I also updated the the wiki. Everything is um, checked into GitHub. So one one thing that uh, I actually wanted to say because we didn't get a chance to explicitly talk about it yet is that. Uh, We've been in a process of trying to move from uh, Mercurial to GitHub, and for the simulation engine, the process is completed. 
So uh, well before in uh, Mercurial we had uh, one repository for the simulation engine with all the bundles contained there for once we moved to GitHub uh, we decided it was better to have a separate repository for each bundle just because well the concept is that these bundles are independent anyway so that they are decoupled there might be some dependency depending on what bundles you're talking about but the idea is that you can take and branch just one of them for instance now currently in my own workspace I'm working on a branch for the solver because I'm also uh, uh, trying to migrate from JOCL to Java CL still and I'm working with the um, with Olivier uh, Shafik, the guy that provides the library in order to have a uh, OSGI based um, version of the library. But basically, uh, all I want to say I suppose, is all this code is now in GitHub. Is uh, The version in Mercurial is basically deprecated. It's probably still uh, available for reading, but that's not anymore where we are committing the code. And so I, ideally, we should move all our code there so that it's all in the same place and then we can add the on Mercurial we can probably keep the wiki in Google code since that's quite powerful and have a link for the sources so that points to GitHub where it's probably easier to have the code uh, where the code is basically more visible and it's possible to follow it blah 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 so that, I think, is a good segue in terms of uh, updated wiki and uh, updated code in GitHub to Porg. Um, thanks, by the way, for, the, for that update. Um, so Porg, uh, I saw some commits uh, coming across from you, both on the wiki side and uh, maybe a little bit on the code side. So uh, um, let's say a little bit about yes. what's new. So um, basically, um, I've uh, updated the wiki page for the NeuroML um, implementation of C elegans, which I will just email around now. So. Okay, so um, this is uh, basically just a quick intro to uh, getting the latest version NeuroConstruct, getting the latest um, C elegans project, which is sitting on GitHub now. Uh, which means also that I probably should um, move away or at least remove the um, version of this from uh, the Mercurial repository on um, Google Code. Oh, yeah, it was the Mercurial repository. Um, so, actually, was it a subversion repository on Google Code? It's Mercurial. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, um, yes, so I think it should be moved away from there. Um, and okay. just did a little bit of um, uh, extra information there, some screenshots and so on. It needs to be expanded a little bit, but hopefully that can be kept up to date with the um, latest on the NeuroConstruct project. And probably what I should do as well is put on some images of it running on Neuron and so on so that um, you can see it runs on a real simulator. So. Terrific. That's awesome. Excellent. Uh, otherwise, the, the only other thing now with the um, uh, NeuroConstruct project is that a lot of the connections between cells are still, um, I mean, ideally, because the entire morphology of each of the cells is there, it should obviously be, if there is a synapse between cell A and cell B, it should be very close. And um, what it's doing at the moment is quite often jumping from one side of the body, one side of the body to another side of the body. Um, uh, so basically picking a random point on each of the pre and postsynaptic cells. So I need to work on that a little bit because a lot of the connections are uh, quite long. Uh, so I need to update that a bit. But in theory, it's producing the correct numbers of s connections between s distinct types of cells as was added to the Excel spreadsheet. So at least there are the connections there. So this might be a good time to also mention a little bit about the Synapse project. Um, I, I invited Steve Cook to this uh, meeting a little bit late, um, so I don't know if he had, he had a chance to, to come in. But um, So there is another, another update from me. Um, I spent some time a couple nights ago trying to get up a version of CatMade um, on Amazon Cloud. This is the software that 
lets you do um, lets you pick the position of synapses on electron micrographs. And uh, Stephen Cook is um, from uh, the Emmons lab, and they work they do this work um, regularly to, on C. elegans to uh, go back through the original EMs and also on new EMs um, and mark the positions of the synapses in addition to you know their <coughs> identity identifying them and identifying what the cells what the cell partners are um, so they're actively doing this work and um, the purpose mm -hmm. of having a cat mate instance up is to uh, invite others from the community to come in and help uh, do this work because it's uh, it sort of takes a long time um, so right now unfortunately after um, a night's work on it I, I, I can't report that it is uh, it is functional yet I ran into some configuration snags uh, that I'm still kind of working out. Um, if anyone wants to help with that, I uh, would greatly appreciate it. Um, I got, I got, you know, the systems installed basically, and an in, in instance was up, and uh, it all should have worked. But uh, for some reason, Apache was responding or something. Anyway, so, um, but uh, the other part of that, which I didn't get to this week, um, which I was going to ping um, Sergey about, was that we do still have a dump of. Uh, the existing database structure that he has used, uh, that Stephen Cook has used in the past to uh, have the positions of the synapses marked. Um, uh, if we want to, uh, and, we've, and we've gone over that in, uh, you know, before the last sprint, uh, t we've gone over it with um, with Sergey and Stephen to kind of understand exactly what the structure is. We have a document that explains how we can parse that um, that MySQL dump in order to get positions out of it. So we are sort of have a strategy for it. Um, Sergey, I know that I, we were going to meet. I, I don't know if you've if, there's, if you've had a chance in the last two weeks since we didn't get a chance to meet to, to look into that anymore. I, I wouldn't expect that you, that you do necessarily, but is there anything new on that, by the way? Uh, no, sorry, I hadn't many time. Yeah, I know that's okay. It's yeah, it's been crazy for yeah, it's been crazy for me too. Well, maybe we can pick that back up. And I don't know, Porg, if you want to be involved in that uh, conversation at all. Uh, basically, the work there is to build some kind of a script that can ingest this. Uh, this MySQL dump and, and populated in the NeuroML, is that...? Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, that would be great. I mean, the thing is that um, what's the basis for what's uh, being used for the NeuroML connection base, or the connections uh, into the NeuroConstruct project and into NeuroML is what's in the Excel spreadsheet, which uh, was under um, the Google code, but is now under GitHub, so we should probably move the old one away. Uh, but that those sets of connections uh, are what's been used. So I mean, I think ultimately it will be have to be a process of either updating those connections or just comparing them, um, because I mean you don't want two separate interpretations of different connections. I mean if they are the same, if there's I mean ideally if it's if they're in agreement, then that would be great, and you can just add extra information on the specific connection points. But more than likely, there'll be some slight differences, and I mean, it'll have to be to a certain. I mean, it would be great to be able to pull out all of those connections, but to a certain extent, at some point, somebody's going to have to actually manually go through those and just see see where the agreements are, see where the major differences are, and so on. So, but I mean, yeah, I'm happy to be involved in that a little bit of time, but um, uh, if there is a way to pull those out, um, I'm sure a Python script can be created to go to the Excel spreadsheet, list the specific connections, hopefully go to the um, uh, MySQL dump, uh, list the specific connections, and at least just see when and where the inconsistencies are. Okay. So this uh, this kind of makes me think about Tim a little bit over over here. Tim, uh, any thoughts, comments on, on this process So, uh, of the data integration with the synapses? Is that something you'd be interested in being looped in on as well? Or Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll plan a time that the, that the four of us, anyone else, by the way, any other takers on this, on this topic out of curiosity? All right. Uh, if you do, if you do decide you want to, just, just send me an email, but I'll, I'll loop the, uh, Sergey, Porg, and, and Tim together on a, on at least just, just sit down for 30 minutes on a strategy to, to like have a look again at this at this dump. Think a little bit about this spreadsheet. Think about how we want to integrate 
Um, and then maybe maybe we can get Stephen uh, Cook as well, potentially, uh, to join. I'll, I'll ask him as well, but I'll set that as another uh, thing for this for this sprint, so that's great. Uh, Tim, you want any other uh, comments? Anything exciting in the last couple of weeks? Um, no, not really, unfortunately. Okay, that's all right. We've been kind of getting ourselves organized, so not a problem. All right, let's go over to the other side of the, of the hangout then. Um, so, uh, Andre, how's it going, my friends? Any any uh, any news? Anything exciting? Uh, today, I can tell that uh, finally we have significant progress. Mm. First of all, um, that uh, function which uh, searches for um, a neighborhood, uh, neighbor particles. Um, is uh, already working, and all the rest uh, functional blocks, which uh, calculate um, density, pressure, uh, perform uh, integration of equations, and so on, uh, all uh, which uh, form uh, SPH algorithm, uh, finally work in our simulation. Uh, it is stable. It is stable uh, if you run it on a CPU. But surprisingly, um, it still sometimes have some bugs uh, on GPU, and um, you have no uh, debugger for this case. But there are some tricks, some special things, uh, and I'm trying to finish this final. Final step uh, to make it completely stable at all hardware, but in general, mm, it works, works very uh, realistic, and we have um, really solved uh, that problem with this uh, that mm, bug mm, where mm, particle uh, density uh, at the uh, grid. Uh, along uh, x, uh, y, and z uh, axis, um, we have seen with, a, with an eye um, during simulation. So uh, after um, I have done a uh, neighborhood search by myself, uh, another algorithm then uh, was an original version. It solved the problem. Um, so now mm, we have success in it, and after fixing bugs in which make uh, GPU unstable, we can move uh, further. I hope in near few days we can start uh, next steps which we uh, plan to do. Uh, for example, to add finally uh, elastic matter and make something which looks like a worm which lies on the table and still not uh, curls, but <laughs> which looks like a worm. No. Awesome. Okay. That's very cool. Here is the progress. That's terrific. Cool. Uh, Sergey helped me a lot uh, with this. We have done it together, I can say. So thanks him for his help. Thank you, Sergey. Awesome. Thank you, both of you. Terrific progress. That's excellent. Um, so we'll look forward to uh, to uh, defining the next steps here in the in the second part of the meeting. Um, but uh, that's excellent. Great. So um, the only person we haven't heard from yet is Balash. Balash, I, I updated the group a bit on your situation in the last meeting, and um, but we're we're excited that you're. Um, that you're still engaged. Um, maybe you just want to recap for the group uh, where you are, where you think yeah, sure. and uh, what's new. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, unfortunately it looks like I won't be able to um, work on CL against and it's purely because of practical reasons. Just uh, very plainly, I just moved here to Edinburgh with my fiance and in order to do CL against I would have to move to Leeds to uh, join uh, Nata Cohen's group. And she was absolutely fine with it, and I made some uh, arrangements. But unfortunately, my uh, fiance Susie wasn't able to get the job in Leeds, but she found something here in Edinburgh. 
And, you know, it, it would be just uh, too unfair to her for me right now to move to Leeds. Uh, so, unfortunately, I think uh, as a PhD topic, I'll, I'll have to uh, leave C elegance aside now. At the moment, I'm, uh, well, I'm just doing a summer project, and then in September, I will have to uh, finalize what I would like to do for my PhD. At the moment, I'm uh, working on the uh, genetics of Drosophila larvae, uh, so somewhat similar uh, system. But uh, uh, when I emailed Stephen, I said that uh, my, heart sta my heart still says the elegance. So I would definitely like to be engaged with this group. And uh, you know, I, I really believe in, in what we are doing here. But it would be just too difficult to work on uh, C. elegans and to do experiments and, and uh, right now. Um, I haven't been doing much in the last two weeks. And it's mostly because I, have, uh, I had exams. I finished them last Thursday. So I will have much more time from now on. And uh, what I'm doing at the moment is pretty much uh, extending on my previous project proposal that is on the OpenWorm website, which is about the, uh, uh, for the Turing test for C. elegans. And by extending it, I mean is that I'm mostly adding to the introduction. Uh, there is this general idea that if you want to extend the Turing test for a general biological system, uh, what you need to do is to uh, so for the classical Turing test, the criteria is, is that can you distinguish a machine, an intelligent person, only based on communication? And for the general biological system, the equivalent question is, is that can you perform any experiments that if you repeat the virtual equivalent of it based on the data, can, the, can a scientist distinguish between the virtual system and the real biological system? And it's very easy to say, but unfortunately, uh, we must restri restrict the uh, validity domain of our model. I mean, at this point, we don't want to do anything to do with genetics and with metabolic networks. I need to be just too complicated. Uh, and I don't really want to go into the details, but uh, once you start to think about, so what does it mean to do the Turing test for C. elegans, there are a lot of complications that come up. And I try to uh, clarify what are those questions, and not necessarily to give the answers, but at least to have a list of the things that we need to think about. Uh, I'm in touch with a few neurobiologists here, and the more I talk to them, sort of like the, the longer the list of the possible issues is. Uh, so I think it's going to be a long process until this, this paper is at the stage where it can be uploaded to the website. But I think I will have something ready uh, prior to the next meeting, uh, which I think it would be good if everybody would read it and give me feedback. I mean, there is not a whole lot of literature on these sort of topics. And I try to be really careful with my uh, thought process. But I might miss some points. And um, it, it's a difficult topic. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to have the first version out uh, before the next meeting. OK. Well, Balash, as I said, you know, uh, I'll just say again, um, we really are your continued enthusiasm and excitement, uh, you know, even if it's not direct you know, work on um, the project, um, you know, is it, just so, so grateful for any contribution at any level um, and, uh, and, you know, just, you know, at the conceptual level, um, at the academic level at looking, you know, things up and structuring arguments and all that, we totally welcome your, your help. So. Yeah, I think that's 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 right now where I see myself fitting into the group uh, yeah. with with these sort of stuff. Also, just a little update to the rest of the group is that last uh, Thursday there was a, a Turing uh, conference here in Edinburgh, where there was a, a prominent computer scientist called David Harrell, and uh, he was talking about many things in his talk. But uh, towards the end, he was uh, talking about his interest regarding creating the virtual equivalent of C. elegans. Uh, I talked to him after his talk. And I didn't talk to him much because uh, he was running off to the airport to catch his next flight. But I got in touch with him via email. Uh, he didn't respond to me. I don't know. Did he get in touch with you, Stephen, by any chance? Mm -hmm. or, or no? No, 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 no email. Well, yeah, unfortunately. OK, well, maybe let's hope he's just busy, because I think he's, he's very, very high up there in the uh, academic ladder. So if, if we would manage to get him involved, then, then, it would be, uh, then it would be great. Yeah, on the recruiting front, also, there is a guy here who is just finishing his PhD. And he will go into uh, C. elegans electrophysiology in the States. Uh, he will join a lab in Princeton or at uh, UMass. I'm not sure if it's the same lab, but it might be the same that you mentioned, Stephen, earlier. 
uh, anyway, his name is Hugh, and uh, we talked about the open worm and uh, surfly keys. Well, he's just going to start it from September, but he's definitely someone who would be, I think he would be willing to share his uh, results in the future. Yeah. Well, on both counts, you know, um, maybe to facilitate the conversation, uh, if, if you feel comfortable sending an email and just, you know, looping me in on, on that, just sort of uh, doing an, an email introduction to, to anyone, I'm always happy to have conversations with folks and, and see what they, you know, what they're interested in or just explain the project one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So yeah, I gave David Tarrell your email address as well. And uh, yeah, I think uh, Hugh, I mean, he's, he's very positive about it. But well, we just need to wait until September because that's effectively when he's going to start his uh, postdoc there. Great, great. Actually, your, your comment about the computer scientist reminded me of another update that I didn't put on the, on the agenda, which, was, which, but, which you were just referring to. Um, so last, um, last Friday, if you were watching the Twitter stream, you might have noticed that I was, uh, or that someone, and that was me, uh, was live tweeting uh, a talk by um, a C. Elegans, a very prominent, um, one, of the, one of the more prominent C. Elegans experimentalists uh, named Corey Bargman, um, Cornelia Bargman. She's at Columbia University, and um, she's, she, a, lot of, um, a lot of students have, have left her lab and gone on to start their own C. Elegans labs. Uh, she's the original uh, advisor of uh, Sri Kanchalsani, who's at the Salk Institute now, who uh, I've, I had some original conversations about this project early on with. Um, so she was in town to give a series of lectures at UCSD on C. elegans, and, um, and, and they were very interesting. And at the end, I had a chance to introduce myself, and I just briefly mentioned the project, and she said that she uh, was interested to hear more about it. So I'm. Uh, so this has sent me into a flurry of wanting to make sure that um, that uh, we we can um, make it very clear to any biologists who come in without any computer background exactly kind of what we're doing and what we are doing and what we aren't doing and just to kind of make it, make it very understandable. So I'm. I have it on my to-do list now just to you know write up a quick you know one-page summary sort of intro to the project from biologist perspective. Um, as to you know why why we're doing this and you know what the approach is. I think sometimes I'll just come in and they're a little a little confused about uh, you know the approach a little bit. You know it's it's a little bit of a culture a culture merge what we're doing here. Uh, you know between biology and, and the computer side. So anyway, um, but I do plan to send that out um, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, and uh, you know we'll see what she says. And uh, you know anyway, it's just good to know that the project is getting out there and that, that people are learning about it. Um, yeah, she, she, she is very prominent, like when I was planning to do my project, pretty much every second reference was to a, a Cornelia Bergman paper. So I think if we would be able to get her on our side, then it would be uh, very, very good. And also I think at this point the, the Open Worm project uh, needs more biologist people. I mean, most of the people here are more the, on the computer science thing, uh, side of the thing, so it's yeah. great news. Yeah, that's absolutely, and and I continue to look for folks on the biology side to, um, you know, to help us understand, and, and so we can be on their side as much as they they've been on our side. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, that's ultimately the, the purpose here. But anyway, we got you know got some muscle cell data now, you know, from actual recordings. So that's I mean I think that's encouraging. Connecting with the biology side, I think if we can do something really nice, even just focused in very um, carefully on the muscle cell, I think that would you know that's going to help. You know, we can show. That we're actually doing some work with data. We can we can help use that data to explain what model optimization is about, <clears throat> and um, you know we can help to explain uh, what this engine is and how that you know fits in. So I think that there's a, you know again in the muscle cell a very nice way that we can do something careful. Uh, I think that will uh, that will have the scientific that will get scientific attention. Okay, so um, we're here um, quarter past uh, top of the hour. Uh, we've got. Yes. I, I just just a quick thing. Um, oh yes, yes. Before please. we move on, just yes, because, yes. Uh, and it's something for, from from It's nothing you should be worried about. I just need your picture and a link for the website. I got one for Ma from Mike and uh, Mike. Did you get the chance to check that out? Are you happy with the the link and the fact that it says UK? <coughs> Would you like me to change it? Uh, well, no, uh, no, I live here, it's fine. Okay. So, Balash, if you send me a, a profile pic, I'll put it on the website. And okay, I will. Any link that you want, whatever, whatever page you want, or if you don't want one, just tell me so. 
an email. I'll send or you something. Yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks. Otherwise, uh, I think the web guys have been known to take screenshots from the uh, from the hangout. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll uh, <laughs> <laughs> either that or you'll become a character from Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you a picture. Let's stick with that. <laughs> there you go. The carrot and the stick. All right. Excellent. So um, if you guys go to the Google Docs, um, uh, the, the Docs app, you'll notice that I added another document in addition to the first agenda, and it's also linked in the agenda under the, the word Agile Process Reboot. It's a, it's a slide deck of 18 slides. I went over this at the beginning of the last release, um, but I just want to kind of go over it again here. I want to see if I, I can get through it as quickly as possible without completely rushing it. Um, and uh, these are all available on our public on our public site uh, because we are starting another another release, and I, I think that you know some of us it's still a little fuzzy as to what that's going to what that's exactly going to entail, and that's okay um, because to some extent you know we are creating this as we go. But um, from another perspective, uh, I think in the first release we found we found it useful to have a bit more structure than we did in the second release. And so I think in this third release, I'm trying to find some happy medium balance between those two ways of operating. Um, this is obviously all open for discussion. Um, my point is here is not to not to bore you, but to open up that conversation. Um, but the the basic idea that we sort of crafted is um, uh, is to take some of the methodologies for developing uh, code that work well um, within organizations and kind of apply it to something as decentralized um, as what we have here. So um, if you if you open up that, that slide deck, um, go to the second um, second slide here. Basically, there's two two motivating ideas behind kind of having some level of organization. Um, the first is that uh, if we can't measure things, we can't manage them. So we can say, hey, we'd like to have a um, fully functioning worm, and then if we can't carve that up in any kind of meaningful way, then we'll always kind of have an open loop. So we have to kind of break that down a little bit. We have to make some measurements. And the second thing is that you know once as soon as you have a plan, uh, it's it's out of date, it's obsolete. So having a plan is is not as valuable as the process of planning, um, and that's something that uh, you know we have to continually engage in as we go here. Um, next slide, slide three. Um, so the balance here that we have to strike is sort of we have to walk the tightrope between uh, making sure that everybody is scratching their own itch, that everyone is doing something. Uh, that they that they feel highly relevant, highly good about, that they feel is related to their own personal interests, is related to their academic interest. Uh, some folks in the project have uh, you know used the project as a way to move their their graduate work forward, um, you know as a source of data, as a source of ideas. Um, so that's absolutely you know welcome. Um, but at the same time, we also need to have we need to have some intersections between these um, between these indiv individual actions and um, sort of a larger perspective, so we're all kind of marching in, in a similar direction. So the basic idea here is that, um, is that no one can assign a task to anyone else. Um, all of this is voluntary. You know, we can sort of suggest, hey, would you, would you be interested in you know, talking about this topic? Um, but we can't really assign stuff in the way that, say, you, know, you do in a company. So uh, some, that part of the agile management uh, you know, doesn't necessarily uh, work so well. So um, we have to come to some consensus as to what we're doing. Feel free to jump in and stop me here at any point. I'm just going to kind of race through this. Um, okay, slide. So slide four um, shows Scrum practices. So Scrum is this methodology that uh, is popular for building things now, and I sort of put it forward as a straw man for kind of what the way that we've operated in the past, and, and sort of the way um, as a straw man for how we could operate in the future. Um, we had done this in, in release one very rigorously, um, and then we sort of relaxed it in release two. Um, so just the basic concept is that, um, and this is taken from a, a book that talks about you know, building game software, um, that you make a big laundry list of all the things you want to have. That's your product backlog on the left. And then every two weeks, you have an iteration. Um, that's, that's what we've been doing with our two weekly, uh, bi-weekly uh, you know, bi uh, meetings, is that we kind of check in on, on a, a time box, uh, a fixed time set uh, that we can work on. And that's the sprint backlog. Um, so, and, and the idea here is that you take something from your laundry list of things you'd like to get done, and you pick it in advance as to the things you're going to work on. You do that for two weeks in something called a sprint, and then um, you, you keep iterating until you, your sprints have added up, and you have something you really call release. Uh, there's something in there called the daily scrum. Don't worry about that. That's, uh, that's probably the least applicable thing 
here because that really does assume that we can all get in the same room. Okay? But basic thing from this is just the concept of a product backlog, the product of a sprint backlog, the concept of a sprint. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, and then the idea of, so how do you go from a product backlog to a sprint backlog? You take something which is sort of a story of something you'd like to have, like in this case of a game, uh, you want to have the player be able to jump. And then what you do is you carve that into um, a series, a plan for how you can accomplish that in terms of tasks. And you assign, and you, and you give some sense of how long you think those tasks are going to take. Okay, so here uh, the animator has to create some jumping animations, a program has to implement jumping controls, a program has to implement jump physics, designer has to do some time, to some time jumping. So the thing on the right here is the idea of what, um, of, of the series of steps that you're going to take, or, you know, that we need to take in order to accomplish that, and, and ideally that's something that you can carve out and, and do in, in, in two weeks. Okay, going to slide six. Um, so what does the product backlog have? So it's a prioritized list of things that we want to get done. Um, so when we first started this project back in February of last year, we, it took us a while to really kind of get as to what it is that we were really trying to drive after and, and how to boil down what we wanted to do. And I think we're kind of in that stage again a little bit. Um, and uh, although we are taking some individual actions that are all moving us forward, um, I, I do want to be sure that we can kind of step, do one step up so we feel like we're all, again, marching to the same beat. So um, what I endeavored to do in the last couple meetings is just kind of get a laundry list from you um, of things that we wanted to do. And, and so I have now actually compiled what we started to talk about into a product backlog list. Um, and so that's why this particular slide is relevant. The way that I've compiled that list together, and, and we'll, we'll go over the list itself here in a moment, um, but the form is in terms of user stories. So I wanted to explain to you user stories and, and why user stories and what's useful about them. So um, a user story uh, has the form uh, as a um, X, I want to Y so that Z, uh, where X, Y, and Z are the, the role of the user, uh, the goal that they want to accomplish, and then optionally uh, for some reason that makes it clear. Now this is, uh, you know, I've I read, you know, read the books on Agile development and Scrum and all this sort of thing, and, and they, they go back and forth as to why they like user stories as a way of defining things rather than, you know, just get X done. And uh, the main reason uh, to do a user story, well, there's a few, but I mean, one of them I think that's important for us to think about is that a user story forces you to go outside of uh, the perspective of I'm writing this code for me to I'm writing this code for someone else or I'm writing this code for someone to be able to do something useful. Because uh, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that um, what we're doing is usable beyond just ourselves um, to get something done. As an open source project, in order to attract other people, in order to you know, show something off that is usable and is useful, we do need to think about who would use it, uh, whether that's a user, end user or a developer, whether it's a scientist, uh, whether it's someone who wants to do computational modeling, um, all these sorts of things. So again, as a sort of a straw man, um, sort of taken what we've, what we've decided um, or, or some of the things that we've thrown out, I wouldn't say that we've got to come to a complete consensus, and I structured them in terms of some user stories. And the last piece of a product backlog that's really important is story points. Um, and uh, I think, I don't know if I go into story points, any more detail later? No, I don't think so. Okay, but the, the thing about story points, and, and this is a, uh, we did this quite a bit, um, or worked, worked to do it quite a bit in the first uh, release, and basically did it not at all uh, in the second release. Um, so it can work, you know, it can work both ways. But the basic idea of them, and, and why I think it's valuable when you have a story, is to just basically give an estimate of, of the size and complexity. And you can use as a proxy, you know, roughly how many man hours you think it's going to take, but the, the point is actually, to, to not worry so much about the unit and to think more about relative size. Um, and that means, of course, that you, this may not be an exact proxy for exactly how long something's going to take. But what it is going to do is it's going to give you a sense that you can agree on the relative size of things. Um, and, and you actually do this through a democratic process, um, which I hope to engage you in here um, if, if this isn't too annoying, um, is, is to basically just get a relative sense of how big we think these different tasks are so that we can use that to help us prioritize what we're doing as we move forward. Now these may be things that individuals work on, they may be things that groups, groups of us work on. Um, that's not necessarily clear from the story, it's just basically trying to get a sense of, of, of the size and complexity of a given thing that we want to do. Okay, 
Um, and then just, just another point just on the top is to the prioritization. Um, it's something that we do, we, we want to generally prioritize user stories that have a high value to the product that we're producing in terms of the code that we're putting out and uh, something that, you know, and, and things go higher which generally have less cost to, to implement. Okay, um, so at slide six, okay. Um, so I think I want to skip over the next several slides and go to slide 12 where it says the story workshop. You guys can flip to that. Um, and just pause for a moment, uh, see if there's any questions right now. No, clear enough. OK. Um, so if some of you have seen this presentation before. I have tweaked it, though, and updated it. So at this point now, talking about the story workshop, um, I'm going to pull an Oprah on you. And those of you, uh, I don't know if you're, if you're all familiar with Oprah, there's a famous episode where she has car keys under the seats of all the audience members, and so she's giving away free cars to whole, her whole audience. So <clears throat> not as exciting as a new car, but um, uh, during the sprint, during the earlier part of the meeting, I did send you all out invites to uh, a site called scrumdo.com. Um, I apologize. I know that we, we do have a lot of different sites that we use um, in the project, and, uh, and this is not for the purpose to clutter anything, but if you will, would go to your inboxes and um, accept the invitation to join the OpenWorm project in ScrumDo. Um, uh, and if, if any of you do not have this invite, please tell me now. Um, um, what you will find in there, um, well, so I'm going to walk, walk us through it here in a moment. But what I'd like to engage you in is to do what this slide talks about, which is the story workshop. And we kind of did this informally, walking through kind of what folks thought we wanted to do. As I said, I tried to compile that down into a list of stories and um, epics. Um, so that particular word, epic, is something you may have seen before. Um, the idea is that an epic is some really big, hairy, audacious goal, which you may not have any idea how you're going to accomplish, but um, is generally a desirable thing. And a story is a sort of a child of that in a hierarchical relationship where a story tries to break out that big goal into some more specific goals in terms of this story format that I've talked about. Um, has everybody been able to get into uh, Scrum Do here while I've been talking? OK. OK. So in a minute, what I'm going to do is uh, switch over to, uh, to that interface. But before I leave this, um, so I'm, I'm going to share my screen here in a minute. But before I do that, I'm going to just uh, explain what the idea of a story workshop is. But essentially, informally, that's what we've been doing for the last two meetings and the last months, is that we've been kind of collecting what people's stories are. We just didn't really call it that. Um, but now I kind of want to, we kind of want to boil that down a little bit. Um, we want to do it in a democratic way. We want to get people's opinions and advice. Um, the purpose of doing this as a group is that um, we all have different expertise to bring to this process. So we don't all necessarily, you know, have see it from the same perspective. So it's to, um, we want to um, create discussion, create um, debate potentially. Um, just, you know, want to keep it uh, at a good level. Um, in terms of a friendly level. So the idea is that you want to collect stories of desired features. Uh, you want to estimate that size um, through a process called planning poker. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to use the tool here on Scrum Do to do that today. Um, and then the goal of this workshop is to get a set of epics and stories that, um, that are not yet scheduled in a way that we kind of have a target for what we want to be doing collectively over the next uh, six months. Okay. So I'm now going to share my screen um, over here. Okay, let's see. Okay, great. So I'm over here. Um, so that this is my invite screen. So hopefully you guys um, have seen this. All right. So um, if you do this on your own screen, I um, want you guys to go over to Projects Release 3. OK, and uh, click here on this interface. And you can go to, um, first thing I want to walk you through is epics. OK, so this was, this was my attempt. And again, I'm sure that some of you are going to look at this and either find something missing or find something lacking in the, in the description of this. But my attempt to kind of consolidate the epics for the, what, I, what I was hearing from the last, um, last sprint is, is represented here. Um, I just tried to group kind of the largest, the largest pieces. 
of, of work um, into these six groups. Okay, so um, basically um, one is as a user, meaning somebody coming to some installed version of the open worm simulation. Uh, I want to see the body of the worm moving and changing color driven by activity of the simulation engine. This very much is, takes from its inspiration um, the work of uh, Cyber Elegans, which did exactly that, um, but adding to it the, um, the fact that it's being driven by the simulation engine that we're building. Uh, the second one here, as a user, I want to see the difference between an unoptimized model and an optimized one. This one may be a little strange. Um, this is my attempt to kind of capture at a very high level um, from an outside perspective what we're doing with model optimization. And the reason I said see the difference between, um, and, and, and this is open for you know, discussion, but the reason I said that was because, you know, I think for the, for the uninitiated um, who doesn't understand why model optimization is important, um, they may not really kind of get that what we're doing is we're trying to fill in the gaps that uh, we can't measure. Um, and there's sort of a philosophical point in there uh, that sometimes I think um, folks coming from the outside don't quite get, which is that they don't, they don't either think that doing model optimization is valuable, um, or they don't see the purpose of it, they don't think that we have enough measurements. So um, I think as a goal of, of what we're doing in model optimization is not just to do it, but to make it clear what we've been able to, what gaps we've been able to fill in, what uh, known unknowns we've been able to add in, and at what level of abstraction and kind of why. Okay, so leave that for a second. Let me get through the rest of these, and, and we'll, we'll talk about these all in great detail. Um, so the third one here, as a user, I want to run a simulation that includes muscle physics as well as muscle cell membrane excitability. This one is basically copied and pasted from last release. And we made progress on this, but we hadn't completed it. So um, just basically added that there. This one is, is sort of the focus on the muscle cell and kind of a higher resolution version of the model. Um, fourth, as a user, I want to be able to mark synapses and have them integrated into the model. This kind of covers this area of um, work with CatMade and then work that we're going to you know, start discussing coming up this next sprint um, about how do we incorporate the positions of the synapses into the model. Um, and, and also, um, you know, anything else dealing with kind of the database side. Uh, fifth, as a scientist, I want a detailed written summary of the physiology. Uh, this was suggested by uh, Porg, and I think we all really liked this idea at the last meeting, where we basically said, you know, um, if if we're not if we're not 100% clear on exactly what the gaps are of the physiology of the C. elegans, then no one else is going to be. So um, this was kind of the research project of you know, on our wiki or, or in some, you know, more formal form, really saying, okay, guys, we're trying to build this thing. Um, from our builder perspective, this is what we see is present in the literature and in the data, and this is what's missing, so that we can use that as kind of an argument to the community and, and, and um, also as a, as a call for, for data sets that we can, uh, you know, publish and challenge uh, the biological community to give us physiology. So that kind of goes under here. Um, and then the last one, uh, as a developer, I want to launch the simulation engine on Amazon AWS. Um, we do still have more than half, I think even more than three quarters of our credits on Amazon AWS that was generously granted to us in an educational grant. Um, uh, you know, I think that uh, we, we've been using it on, uh, ourselves for our own prototyping purposes, um, for the ability to get access to higher computational resources, um, and I think that uh, it might be a valuable thing to let folks who want to code on the on the um, project to be able to launch the simulation engine, maybe and, and not just on, on AWS but also on their local systems. The reason I say Amazon here is because um, we have run into some challenges of drivers on multiple systems, and it is certainly um, more challenging to support multiple architectures than it is to support a single architecture. And the beauty of Amazon AWS is that we could target a single architecture. So um, the idea of this is that it might be a more approachable way to distribute um, what we're doing from the simulation perspective to, to just target that one architecture. But, um, okay, so broadly speaking, uh, those are kind of the, the epics that I sort of outlined. So let me just stop right here and just open it up to anybody who, and forget about these, forget about these numbers for the moment, um, but just in terms of the very highest level groupings, um, does this seem reasonable? I have some stories underneath here. Um, uh, if you're wondering about uh, where things fit, but I don't want to kind of go through them until we, until um, 
we, we, I have a chance to, to get your feedback on, on this much. So what's missing? What's wrong? Um, what, what, do you, what do you like? What, what, uh, what should we change? Uh, Stephen, I have a question. Does this tool allow, because I, I haven't uh, found my way around it yet, but does it allow basically for each one of us to track? Uh I'm sorry, you, you cut out there. Does it allow to track what? Uh-oh. It's frozen. <laughs> it's frozen. Track progress. Oh, there we go. Track progress. Um, I believe it does. I believe it does. And um, by the way, by throwing this tool at you, I, I don't necessarily mean to suggest that we will absolutely use this. Um, it is to some extent a suggestion. What I found it useful for uh, doing potentially is just you know organizing ourselves in terms of these these epics and stories for the purpose of the beginning part. Um, we can make it as a as a as a follow on discussion um, how we continue to use it. Um, but I think it can do that. Um, you know, previously we've been using Jira. I felt it was a little complex for our purposes, for everybody to come to. Um, we, you know, we could use that again, but um, but its complexity I think was a little daunting uh, for some, and, and I think for me as well. Um, so hopefully this is a way that we can do a lot of things uh, to answer your question, Matteo. But um, and I think progress tracking is one. But right now I do want to focus just on the content here, so that we kind of think that this is the general direction that we're moving in. Honda content is the simplified worm we talked about uh, under the first item, or is it something that is cross component? Yeah, I I think that it I think that it would fit under there. I think since we hadn't fully defined how simple it would be or how complex, etc., this was meant to be more general. But in general, I think we were all under the agreement that we wanted to see something moving, changing color. Okay, so as the first step of that epic. It will be the simplified worm. Okay, good. So let's so let's I, I don't know if I have that story under here right now, but let's um but let's hold on to that as uh, something that we would put under there if it's not. Uh, but we yes, have something that. like that. Um, but okay. it doesn't it says I want a visualization of the C elegance that moves. Right, right. right. That, that that could be Okay, yeah. So it could be under there. So that's good. Um, but other things just on the on the highest level. <coughs> um, the optimization point E6. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not entirely sure about the phrasing of that. As a user, I want to see the difference between an unoptimized model and an optimized one. Yep, I, I figured you um, might have a comment on that. So, can you propose? Well, uh, let's talk about it. I mean, the the problem with the phrasing of that is you could always make the argument well. Uh, what is an unoptimized model? You know, perhaps your perhaps your optimized model is so much better than your unoptimized model because you haven't done a decent job of figuring out figuring out good model parameters through intuition. Um, I don't. I, E6. I don't even know if it's necessary to have it at such a high level at all. It, it's kind of a subset of E3 in a way. E3 and E5. Okay, that's fair. Um, so it could potentially go under under those. Uh, let's see, under E, under E five, or you mean um, how well, about the muscle cell, the muscle cell one? Um, well, we're not using optimization. In future, we'll be using it for not only muscle cell but also optimization, really, of any kind of biological, biologically unconstrained parameters. Yes. Right? Yes, that's right. But um, but I do but I do want us to think a little bit just in terms of a, a chunk of time which is uh, six months, um, mm -hmm. and what we would what we would reasonably want to attempt that we could complete um, in six months. So um, so yes, how about it, 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 yeah, as a user? How about as a user? I want to see the value of using automated optimization, something like that. Just leave okay, it the, the value of using what? Automated optimization, just something a bit more broad than it is currently. Okay. Okay. I don't know what anyone else thinks about that. Let's see what I put under here as well, just for the conversation. Right. So the story under this, where I want to tune our muscle cell model using model optimization on real data, which is kind of the story that that um, I, I think that we're we're going down here. Um, 
I think as a user, what, what you want to see is that the optimized data matches experimental results. Um, yeah, is, that's that, is, that, is that it? Exa yeah, exactly. I think Giovanni, that's an ex that's an excellent that's an excellent uh, epic. Sorry, can you say that again? As a user, I want to see if the I want to see the optimized data matching the experimental results. The optimized optimized data matching experimental results. Yeah. That that is more yeah. that is more focused. Um, so there are other things which kind of fall outside that, um, but I I do like it, um, and I and I think I'd be happy to, to replace it. But just to just as a point of discussion, um, beyond just matching, um, I think the implication is that um, right. So so the idea is that you could match the you could match the results in many different ways with many different parameters. Uh, many different sets of parameters will give you the same match. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'd, I'd say that um, this might be underneath um, seeing the value of automated model optimization. I think, a, but I think that the value of, op of, mo of automated um, model optimization goes beyond um, just matching the experimental results. Yeah, the behavioral level, it, it, it does, but in terms of the optimization epic, if you have a set of uh, optimized uh, uh, parameters, then you're you're happy enough that you have a set, and then you try and put them in the simulation to see what kind of behavior emerges. Maybe some set works well, some other set doesn't work at all. Um, I guess, but in terms of the epic of the optimization, there's only so much you can do because in theory you don't even have a host where to plug those. Uh, optimized parameters in, uh, in, in a larger kind of uh, emergence of behavior driven scenario. Uh, so yeah, there is definitely some cro crossover between that and the other. My inter in terms of the optimization epic, that's as far as you can go, I guess. I'm happy, so, yeah, I'm happy to do this because I like it because it's um, the scope is I think even more tightly defined and I'm I'm all for having tightly defined scope. Yeah, I mean you could have in there something else that says, and then I want to see that right. uh, the optimized stuff, how, how the optimized stuff performs in in a broader context of behavior emergence, but it's like it's outside the optimization task itself. I don't know that that is my view from. I stand it from here. I I agree, I agree with Giovanni. Everything he said, I agree with. Terrific. All right, let's keep it there then. Other comments? Going once, going twice. <coughs> um, I think generally agree with the overall approach and I think the main thing will be just to um, over time try to flesh out the uh, kind of lower level stories and see just make sure that the um, kind of top level epics fit in or are sufficient to cover all of those kind of tasks that we know need to be done so I mean this is probably a good initial framework for it and then if there are things which don't fit into any of these then they can be modified, but I think as a first approximation until everybody actually gets used to using it, um, it's probably a good initial set. Okay, well, it's, um, so funny you mention it, because there, <laughs> there are stories under here, um, again, that I've tried, to, I've tried to collect, and I don't think I've, I've gotten them all yet. But um, in order can to... Ask, yes? Can I ask a quick question? I don't know if uh, you might have already said this. Um, point E5, as a scientist, I want to see a detailed written summary of the physiology. Right. Just to clarify, does this mean detailed written summary of the physiology which we which we which we get from literature and get from labs, or physiology which we infer from the modeling? Um, or you, you sort of suggested this originally. Did you want to? Yeah, I, I think it's more. Um, well, I mean, I, I I think it came down to something like um, the neurons themselves don't have action potential things that we we are assuming are going is going to go into the model or have already built into the model but basically uh, 
something we can write down in the, the description of the physiological properties that we want in the model, which you can hand to a, an, a, an electrophysiologist or a, a biologist who knows C. elegans, and they can say yes or no, that's a realistic thing to actually include in your model, or that's a realistic understanding of the situation. Um, and that can be refined, uh, but then as opposed to getting a very thick book on C. elegans physiology and giving it to everybody in the project, if there is some summary of what we want to build and what we're aiming for, then I think that would be a useful overview because not everybody is going to uh, come into the project with the time or the inclination to learn all of the um, detailed physiology. But if we can get a, a summary of this, then that would be very useful. Yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. Could could we make the point a bit more clear? Because it wasn't clear to me that that's what it meant. I I, mean, I agree that that's a great idea. But if we could clarify that point a bit. Yeah, I mean, any any proposals for how to? So I I, I clipped this uh, out of the last uh, the notes from last time, um, but um, but in terms of making the story uh, crisper, um, suggestions. A uh, detailed written summary of the physio physiology we intend to include in the model. that do it. Is it, also, is it also a case of documenting what we don't have in the process? Yeah, I mean, it, it would be useful actually. I mean, for example, um, okay, we want, we want physio physio physiologically realistic um, spiking muscle cells, and then it would be good to highlight in there that, okay, yes, this physiological data is missing. So, I mean, ideally, if it is something you give to anybody doing uh, C. elegans um, uh, physiology, then they'll be able to read it and say, yeah, okay, it's sensible. Yes, by the way, I have this uh, particular piece of data. How about, I want a detailed written summary of the known and unknown physiology we intend to include in the model. Well, no. I'm sure they will claim, I mean, we probably don't want to put too much unknown physiology in there, but I mean, okay, I mean, if, if we say, okay, obviously we want realistic um, uh, cells, we want realistic electrical properties in each of the neurons, okay, it's fair enough to think that uh, maybe you don't have all the details of the channels, but... Okay, so should we leave that, should we leave that known and unknown thing out, do you think? Uh, maybe, well... Yeah, well, for the title at least, I mean, like the physiology. Yeah. But the thing, we, we can actually mention in the um, in this summary that, okay, we want to build uh, cells which incorporate um, uh, conductance-based, which are conductance-based um, cell models. And we can highlight there that at the moment we don't know the specific uh, channels present in each neuron. And if we put that into the document, somebody reads that and says, well, actually, I know for one particular cell the all the channel types in there, and that's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's so okay. <clears throat> okay. So big hairy goals. Those are the epics. The stories break these down. Um, so let's see here in the last uh, sort of twelve minutes, and I will uh, I will sharply cut off here at the top of the hour because I got another meeting to run off to. So let's see if this works. Um, so what I want you guys to do is under under release three here, um, you should find this thing called planning poker. Use planning poker to size stories of the team. All right, and um, so I guess I'm going to play the role of the scrum master. Um, and let's see, please pick a story. Do That's we story. bet money? <laughs> <laughs> um. It's not a uh, yeah. It's not betting money. It's just sort of we all go around on a single story and we add it. Now I was kind of hoping that we would uh, have the ones, the stories that we've already, the list that we've already kind of uh, we've already got. Let me see if uh, actually that's the way to do it. Um, let's see. Oh boy, I should have tried this beforehand. Okay, uh, let's see. The idea... Uh, 
I have these stories already, and I want them to show up in here. I thought they would. No stories found. Show all stories. How about that? Aha! Okay. Show all stories. Good. Stories of size. All right. Perfect. So, um, as a user... Oh, wait. Okay. So it looks like folks are coming in. Okay, that's good. Okay, as a user, I want a visualization of the sea elegans that moves. Um, can I... Looks like I can maybe drag this somewhere. Maybe you need to click size story. Size story. Ah! Okay. Awesome. So, okay, I think the way this, I think the way this works is that, um, Infinite. hopefully that all, that all popped up, okay. Do you notice that there's, there's scoring here, okay, and it's kind of in a, in, it's, a it's in a scale that's intended to be able to d differentiate um, small from large, um, where infinite is the largest thing, zero is it takes, like, no time, and then some small gradations here on, on the bottom, um, and the point is that this is the scale we're going to choose to use, and we're going to apply it to all our stories, so it really only matters relative to each story um, what size we pick. Now, I think in order to do this, I need to not show you my screen, because the point of the, po the poker part of this is that we all sort of vote independently of each other without biasing each other to begin with, and then we kind of arrive at what, at what the story is kind of democratically. Okay? And so... Um, and I think we have a, and, and as part of doing this, we have a bit of a discussion as we arrive um, at, at some consensus as to what the size of the story should be. Uh, obviously, we're not going to finish this in the next 10 minutes, but if we at least get started, um, we, can, we can do this process um, uh, offline uh, afterwards. So let me, let's, let's try this. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, uh, go back to my video. And, Mike, had, uh, uh, Mike, Mike had to go. Mike had to go, okay. Um, all right, V2, V3 now, okay. Um, and uh, so let's go ahead and, and, uh, and, and score this one. So as a user, I want a visualization of the sea elegans that moves. Very high level story, um, and, um, and depending on how we choose to do it, it could be, uh, it could be complicated or it could be uh, straightforward. But um, um, Stephen. Yes. I think uh, we can see only stories that you have sized, because you're the Scrum Master. Looks like two people have voted already. On what? <laughs> On that story? Yeah. <laughs> so how did because you do it, Matteo and Fork? It's the only one that's been sized by you. I uh, just went to planning poker and clicked, well, the number one as a user I want to visualize the organs that moves was Listed and I just clicked on 100. Oh, yeah. I think we only. Yeah. No, think you shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. What, what kind of poker player are you? <laughs> this card's face down. <laughs> okay, so remember, this is an estimate of how hard we think it's going to be relative to other things in the project. Okay. I can see all your votes. Yeah, once you vote, oh. you can see it. Uh, oh, okay. Before you can. Yeah, but then I, I, I can see it and then I change it. But if, if one person votes infinite, then it doesn't matter what everybody else is. The average will still be infinite. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Oh, great. <laughs> it's probably not, not strictly mathematical. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't say it. Don't say it yet. Um, all right, uh, are we missing anybody? Sergey? Uh, Andre, I don't see. I don't think you're in. Uh, I'm not uh, registered yet in the system. Uh, in that. Did you get an invite? Uh, I've got an invite, uh, but still have not uh, completed. Okay. Okay, uh, I can try. If you want to, yeah. yeah. It's not mandatory, obviously, but uh, but it might be useful. We will, we will get there. There is an SPH story here, um, a, a little bit farther down. Um, but I think the point of all of us voting on these things is to get a relative sense of uh, of where we're at. Phew! Oh, good. <laughs> um, uh, Stephen, one thing yes. that I think it will be interesting is uh, not interesting, maybe useful is. Um, 
I f uh, have a friendly name for the epics because they have such long u user story names that uh, I mean for example I'm just looking at uh, epics and uh, it would be nice for E3 to be called to be like shortened to not 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 in the description but somehow I don't know if there is even is a way to call it that. that's the simplified worm then the optimized data stuff is that's the optimization stuff I, every epic matches to one of those tracks those tracks mm -hmm. I'm I'm kind of having trouble matching all of them to tracks that's why I'm asking so for example the um, yeah that's that's only the only reason why I'm asking so that yeah. We always know what we're talking about. Yeah, so we, what we can do is we can create categories, actually, um, that okay. are separate. Oh, can we do that? Epic That's tools. nice. Yeah. So, I'll, That's I'll, cool. so we'll do that here offline. That's cool. Okay, let me, let me hit save. Okay, and see what that does. Hmm. Steven, can you send me uh, an invitation to this system at some point? I, I, I just checked my emails and I didn't get it. You didn't get it. Okay. No. Sorry about that. I, I, I Don't didn't, worry. didn't tend to. Let's see. <laughs> oh, I see. I misspelled your... I'm sorry. I misspelled your, your address. Okay. Um, okay, so I hit save um, on that one, um, and then it went away. <laughs> um, All the bots are reset? Uh, I hope not. I don't um, see the bots anymore. I... I I just see forty, as in your vote. Okay, I think the majority. I think the majority there was for a hundred, so I think it should be for a hundred. Um, I think that's what we should we should pick for that one. Um, I think Sergey and I are optimists. Um, okay, let me get everyone. Is, oh, <laughs> Stephen, not Stephen. <laughs> Sergey is not optimistic anymore. <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Balasha, you should now have a you should now have an uh, invite. Um. Okay, and uh, potentially oh, nice. <laughs> potentially, we should uh, do this for for all of them, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. But maybe um, we should go through the process of uh, like creating the subtasks together and then voting on everything. Yeah. Okay. So, do we were were we just voting on the same one um, that we were doing there? Um, I, I think so. I don't I don't know why I didn't pick it up. Uh, it, it's like Stephen saved uh, and then it disappeared and now we can vote again and it's not clear to yeah, me what exactly weird. happened. Yeah, that's that was weird. surprising. Okay. Look. So so I so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit the story manually here and I'm going to move it to 100 and I'm going to update the story. Because I think that's basically yeah I don't I don't really know what save does but I've now updated it to to be a hundred okay so as a user I want a visualization of the elegant that moves now a hundred um, okay so now I'm gonna I'm gonna pick the second one as a user I want a browser based visualization to show me the muscle cell output okay that's now that now should be the story that we're sizing let's see yes okay so now put in your votes for number two as a user I want a browser based visualization to show me the muscle cell output this is just the muscle cell output. What's going on? I, I, I'm just sorry. There's no eighty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other votes to come in? The muscles. Ju just the muscle cell output. No, there's no feedback loop. Right. Right. This is a visualization to show me the muscle cell output. Yeah. But well, with on its own, you right? See, you see just the muscle cell instead of the whole worm. Sweet. All right. So that one's correctly sized. Okay. Good. So we got through well, two. Uh, one, one thing. Uh, one thing that I don't understand, though. I personally don't think that the whole worm is a hundred and that this is forty. Why can't I pick something in between forty and hundred? Uh, because um, this is just a rough way to kind of get a sense of whether something is really big or, or smaller. It's like, it's like less than the half of it, and I don't think it's less than the half of it. Yeah, the, fi the Fibonacci sizing is really that it's like 
extra large versus large kind of thing. Um, so um, that's kind of the idea behind it. Um, you, basically, you're supposed to just round to whichever you think is closer. If you think it's 81, then pick 100. If you think it's 79, then pick 40. Um, okay, but a lot of people pick 40 on that one. Okay, so uh, got to run. It's the top of the hour now. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. Um, uh, I think we do this part we do have to do in real time, but um, but you can continue to look through the stories on the site here. Feel free to um, to ask questions um, on there, to send me emails about uh, any any of this, post on T-Box, um, all that good stuff. We will pick this up on our next major meeting. I'll, I'm sure we'll also be doing some edits um, separately in our individual um, in our you know in our in our breakout meetings over the course of the next two weeks. Um, I did set this calendar time for uh, regularly for this time um, every other week. So hopefully um, you guys will see that. I'll I'll continue to reinvite us. But um, but thank you everyone for uh, for attending and um, and uh, anything else anybody wants to close with any just before we we go. Any last comments? Uh, no, just uh, quickly that um, I noticed that it pulled in, so I signed in with my um, GitHub uh, ID and it pulled in some issues that I had from the GitHub uh, C. Elegans NeuroML project, so I think it might be convenient to actually integrate that in some way with, if you want to put issues onto GitHub for projects uh, yes. that can be pulled in here, apparently. Yes, sorry, I didn't mention that. Yes, I did that, and in fact, all our GitHub repos I added so that uh, the activity stream on them shows up in this in this tool, which is sort of a nice integration. Um, but again, so I mean, that that may be a reason to keep using this after we're through the the planning process um, as a as a more complete thing. But um, but uh, no pressure now um, for that. Okay. Um, all right, guys. Thanks very much. Um, see you in two weeks, if not uh, if not sooner. And okay. uh, you'll you'll be getting email from me. Okay. Sounds good. Have a great evening. Bye, guys. Have a great day. Bye, bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 bye.